in this lecture, what I'd like to do is to actually now dive into uh, how we might implement repeated measures models in code for both a maximum likelihood approach or a Bayesian approach. Um, and I will say that how I implement a repeated measures model in code is just a, uh, a, a slight extension of how I would implement an autoregressive model in code uh, more generally. And so, you know, you could, this is also essentially a tutorial on how to code up autoregressive models more generally um, in maximum likelihood or Bayes. Uh, just when you, if you have a single time series, you just are drop, going to be dropping the loop over time. So I'm going to dive in, assuming that we're looping over multiple observational units, but this works just as well if you only have one. You just, it's actually simpler if you only have one. Uh, so the example I'm going to use to, to show how to implement autoregressive models is to imagine that I have, <clears throat> uh, if I'm interested in the relationship between growth and some covariate x, uh, I'm going to consider a population of individuals. and in this case, to keep things simple, I'm going to assume that they are census three times. And I'm going to assume that growth is a function of that x. So I'm going to write down first my process model. Mu, the, the predicted growth rate, uh, depends on an intercept, a slope, and that covariate x. And now in the subscripts, mu is varying both by individual for rows and time for columns. And I similarly have my x data organized uh, with individuals in rows and time in columns. Uh, so I have a whole matrix of x's for that single x. So in this case, you know, usually when we have a matrix of the x's in a regression model, there were there are different covariates. But here, this matrix of x's is the same covariate uh, just over time. Um, so that's going to be our process model. It's just starting with a very simple linear process model. And then we're going to write down uh, a data model. So to keep things simple, I'm going to say our y data here, which is growth, uh, is going to vary uh, according to a normal distribution with that mean and with uh, a, a variance. Now the difference between our normal data model, our, our typical Gaussian data model and what we're doing here is that instead of having independent errors on that Gaussian model, I'm now assuming a multivariate normal. So multivariate normal, uh, in this case, the, the subscript three here is indicating that this is a, a three by three uh, multivariate normal. You'll see that with the growth data here, I have indexed this by I, individual and put a vector on it to indicate this is a vector. So I'm now fitting, uh, I'm, I'm considering all of the data from that individual's growth over time all at once. And I'm considering the predictions from my process model at those different points in time all at once. And in doing so, I now have a co covariance matrix here rather than just having a single sigma. But as we discussed in the lecture on AR models, autoregressive models, we can write down that covariance matrix uh, as one that involves uh, sigma, our overall residual error, and rho, which is our autocorrelation coefficient. And as a reminder, you know that involves a matrix of correlations. So uh, any time point is perfectly correlated with itself. At, time lag one, it's correlated with rho. At time lag two, it's correlated rho squared. And that's just because if this is at rho, and then we take additional lag, it's rho times rho. And then additional lag, it's rho times rho times rho. Um, yeah, and then the one over rho squared comes out in the denominator because of an analytical solution involving uh, finite sums, right? you know, infinite sums. So it's a, it's a sub, you know, a just basic algebra for for repeated sums. Okay, um, so that's our, our process model and our data model. Let's look at how we would actually implement this. So I'm going to first start looking at how we'd implement this in maximum likelihood. So as a reminder, the basic approach that we're going to take for numerical approaches to maximum likelihood is we're going to write down 
our log likelihood function, and then we're going to use some sort of numerical optimization approach to optimize that likelihood. So let's walk through this code uh, line by line. So first, at the start, I'm going to load up a library to provide me with a multivariate normal distribution because uh, for whatever reason, there's not a default multivariate normal distribution <clears throat> within R. So we have to load one from a library. There's actually a few different libraries that provide multivariate normal distributions. They all can be treated equivalently. Oops. Uh, next, I'm constructing this matrix H, uh, which is just a distance matrix. So this matrix H is telling me at time point one, two, and three uh, that time point one is zero distant from time point one. Uh, time point uh, two is the unit one away from time point one, and three is two away from one. So this is just a, a matrix of all the pairwise distances in time. So this is a distance matrix in time uh, between our different observations. And the fact that these are integers are implying that those distances are are uh, constant, that, that uh, the, the remeasurement period is constant in this data set. And that's actually an assumption that can be relaxed. You don't necessarily strictly have to have those distances be constant. <clears throat> Okay, so this is just a bit of setup. We loaded a library, we made a distance matrix. Now let's look at the likelihood function itself. So here's my log likelihood function. It's a function, I'm gonna pass in theta, which is again, as we talked about earlier in the semester, just a vector of all the parameters that um, is being passed in the log likelihood function. First thing I'm gonna do is unpack that vector of theta to the first two thetas are just gonna be my intercept and slope for beta. Uh, the third parameter is going to be sigma, our residual error. And the fourth is this additional parameter rho, which is the uh, autocorrelation coefficient for this AR model. Uh, so now armed with little sigma and rho, I'm going to use those to construct big sigma, my covariance matrix, which is actually relatively simple to do because we have this sigma 1 minus rho squared out front. And then we have uh, the, the correlation matrix, which I can get by just taking rho and raising it to the power of that distance matrix. So rho to the h is, gives me this uh, covariance matrix. And this is kind of why we pre-computed h, because the distance matrix stays the same regardless of what rho is. But every time our numerical optimization scheme proposes a new rho, we need to construct a new correlation matrix. So we're going to be having to construct that correlation matrix every time we loop through uh, and propose different rows. OK, so now we've just pulled out our parameters. We've calculated our uh, covariance matrix, given the two parameters used to calculate it, uh, sigma and rho. And now we just uh, are going to actually calculate the likelihood. So if we jump down here, we can see that uh, First, I'm using this DMV norm. So that's a, a multivariate normal as a, instead of just DM norm. Sorry, instead of just D norm. But normally we'd just have D norm here. So now we have DMV norm. Uh, the Ys are our data G. And as before, I noted that G is indexed by I individual. And I'm now looking at all T. So I don't have to say which T I'm looking at because I'm looking at all of them. So I'm practicing passing in the vector of the observed y data for an individual as we're looking at the autocorrelation of those observations across individuals. Our process model is exactly the same as it would be otherwise, our intercept plus slope times that vector of x's. And again, that, that the x's for that individual over time. Uh, I pass in my covariance matrix instead of just my fixed sigma. and the, and then I say log equals true, as we do for any log likelihood function. And as in any log likelihood function, I also have a minus up here in order to change the sign. If I just had a single time series, uh, that's all I would do. Uh, in this case, I have multiple time series. So I'm going to have to set up a loop over those time series and add up the contributions of the likelihoods for each of those individual uh, 
likely it's like this point here, the, the L equals L minus this is just a sum. So I'm starting initializing the likelihood at zero, and then I'm just summing up, I'm doing a loop and summing up the contributions from each of these uh, individual um, likelihoods. And since uh, multivariate normal is already vectorized, it's kind of hard to vectorize this to do uh, everything all at once. And then I'm just returning that uh, log negative log likelihood value. And again, we would then take this log likelihood function and put it in you know, whatever numerical optimization uh, routine we, we like to use. When I look at the fits to this data, this is the same uh, data that I showed uh, earlier when I was talking conceptually about uh, repeated measures models. Uh, we first see that we get this purple line here, which is the overall fit. So we get an intercept, we get a slope, we get a relationship between our x, our resource x, and our growth rate y. Um, and we only, we actually only get one relationship. So this would be different from our uh, random effects model where we would have had a line for every uh, individual in the data. Here we still, we just have one overall line, uh, but we have also an estimate of the autocorrelation in the error. So we have a, a row of 0.65, which is a fairly high correlation coefficient, uh, but not super, super strong. It's not like 0.9 or something. Uh, so there is autocorrelation in the error which reflects the fact that we, we see uh, observations for individuals connected over time uh, you know, are showing persistent errors. The other thing we see is if we look at the sigma, the lowercase sigma, the little sigma, uh, that describes our residual error, uh, the, the residual error for the AR1 model is actually a good bit lower than if we'd fit this just as an uncorrelated linear model. So that's actually, you know, you know the benefit here. So, you know, often, you know, dealing with the autocorrelation and, and errors may seem like a pain. It makes things harder. Uh, it's also going to clearly acknowledge that your effective sample size is lower than the pure number of data points. It's not actually reducing it. It's, you know, your, your effective sample size is reduced. Uh, you know, by fitting this in an LM, you would be generating an, a falsely overconfident estimate of your intercept and slope because you would have been inflating the, the sample size beyond what it actually is. Uh, but the, the, the silver lining is that our estimate of our residual error has actually gone down. And that's because it's acknowledging that these residual errors are, are autocorrelated and, you know, so, the differences we're seeing, the persistent differences we're seeing are not a reflection of deficiencies in our model structure. They're reflecting the fact that those errors are autocorrelated. Uh, next, moving on to a Bayesian approach, we can implement uh, this same model in JAGS relatively simply. So here I've just put in red the things that would be different between uh, a standard linear regression in JAGS uh, versus uh, now a, a repeated measures linear regression in JAGS. Um, so we have our beta and our sigma, just like in the R code, we have our row. Uh, we put a prior on that row. In this case, I've put a uniform on it between minus one and one because that is actually the full allowable range that row can take on. You know, a, a correlation coefficient less than minus one or, or bigger than one is not defined. As in the R code, I then need to calculate uh, big sigma, the covariance matrix. Uh, but here we'll see that that calculation over here is identical. Uh, you know, we have the oh, one minus rho squared rho to the h. Um, the one difference here, I am now taking a one over sigma because sigma was a precision. So I need to now have a one over sigma to convert that back to uh, a variance. And then once I calculate my covariance matrix, I use this inverse function to convert that to a precision. So like a univariate normal distribution where it's gonna work with uh, sigmas being a precision with a multivariate normal, 
the big sigma covariance matrix needs to be converted to a precision matrix. But that's simple to do with just this inverse function. Okay, and then uh, in JAGS, we already had to have a loop over individuals, so that nothing has changed there. Um, we're calculating, uh, actually one thing that is worth noting is that we are now calculating a vector of means uh, from a vector of x's, so noting that, that JAGS does, not, does actually allow uh, matrix computations, simple matrix computations uh, in, in the process models. We haven't actually exploited that feature thus far, but it does allow this. Uh, and then we're dealing with the uh, multivariate normal and a whole vector of observations. So we have a vector of observed data, a vector of predicted means, a uh, precision matrix, and now we're using the multivariate normal. And, and you can see that the structure of this is very analogous to both our uh, linear model in uh, JAGS we had previously and the um, how we added auto regressive error to uh, the maximum likelihood component. In fact, you know the the only difference really between the maximum likelihood and Bayes version is that this, we have this additional uh, precision on uh, additional prior on row, and that we're dealing with precision matrices instead of covariance matrices. Uh, next, I'll also point out that we can deal with uh, AR processes within state space uh, models as well. And so the Bayesian version of an autoregressive repeated measures model, um, you know, that we just looked at, it, it didn't separate process error and measurement error. If we wanted to do that in a state space framework, we can extend our state space model to a repeated measures model. Uh, and you know it's it's relatively straightforward. We have you know now a uh, latent uh, process model where we have uh, growth of some individual at some point, time point being normally distributed with our linear uh, uh, linear model for the uh, predicting the, the mean state plus our autocorrelation coefficient and the growth rate. Uh, this is what this, this relationship between growth at t minus one and growth at t is kind of what we always had in state space models because remember state space models are dynamic. So we have this dynamic connection between uh, growth at one time point and growth at another time point. But now we also have this covariate effect and we have our process error sigma. And then we have this observation error uh, model and uh, connecting the observed growth is growth to the predicted growth with some observation error tau. Um, one of the things you'll note that in the state space model, we do not need to construct that full covariance matrix uh, because each latent state is conditionally independent. The observed data is conditionally independent on each other, conditioned on the latent state. Um, in practice, the biggest difference between what we've already been doing with state-based models and uh, which we're in dealing with time series and now the uh, repeated measures version of a state-based model is that now uh, we actually have to loop over both individuals in time. So remember when we implemented uh, a Bayesian state-based model, we had to loop over time and keep, you know, predict the next observation as a function of the current observation. We had to loop over the data and look you know, look at the observation errors. Now in a, in a repeated measure state space approach, you know, a model where we have multiple time series, we need to loop over uh, individual or, you know, measurement unit, you know, location, whatever, as our outer loop. Uh, and then within that, we're gonna loop over time as our inner loop, um, which is actually pretty straightforward. It's the same state space model that you would have written down before, but now you're adding a loop over multiple locations. 